And this life is for you, you say to peace. You know, we, we chase after many things. We really do. I mean, success, material, prosperity, security, fame, relationships and friendships, happiness, contentment, purpose. And the world, you know, it teaches us many things. And one can't talk about Jesus without realizing that though the answers the world gives may seem to satisfy the masses, the path to life in Jesus Christ is about selfless love, it's about humble service, and it's about a way to sacrifice. This morning a man comes to ask Jesus about eternal life. In the last few chapters of Mark, we've already heard Jesus talk about his inevitable arrest, his suffering, his death. Jesus has told us, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And though we skipped the passage when I was going through Mark, there's one in there, too, where Jesus goes up the mountain and is transfigured before his closest friends, where he is cloaked in power, and the voice of God comes booming. This is my son, marked by my love. Listen to him. Jesus has offered healings and taught us the fundamentals of faith about humble service. And yet the disciples, like us, continue to get it wrong. Just last week, Jesus condemns divorce. But at the time, Jesus was really advocating for women who in the patriarchal Jew Jewish culture were treated as less than in the next few verses after that, though the disciples try to keep children away, Jesus invites another group without power to come. Children in his day, saying that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And that brings us to the reading for today about a rich man seeking Jesus out with his spiritual quest for eternal life. Now I want to remind you that you know, when we hear that word eternal life, we automatically think of the afterlife. And I understand that, and there's a part of what Jesus is saying that is, that is true. But Jesus was also talking about this life. And in the Greek, in the way that Jesus uses the word eternal, he's talking about knowing God in this life. So keep that in mind as you hear this passage. The scripture today is from Mark 10, verses 17 through 31. As he went out into the street, a man came running up, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. He said, Teacher, I have, from my youth, kept them all. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. He said, There's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And come follow me. The man's face clouded over. That was the last thing he expected to hear. And he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who had it all to enter God's kingdom? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing, but Jesus kept on. You can't imagine how difficult. I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for the rich to get into God's kingdom. That set the disciples back on their heels. Then who has a chance at all, they asked. Jesus was blunt. No chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you let God do it. Peter tried another angle. We left everything and followed you. Jesus said, mark my word. No one who sacrifices house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, land, whatever, because of me, the message will lose out. They'll get it all back, but multiplied many times in homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land, but also in troubles. And then the bonus of eternal life. This is, once again, the great reversal. 
Many who are first will end up last, and the last first. This is the word of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. A wondrous God of abundant blessing and grace, God of love, justice, we long to be close to you, to know you, to feel your abiding presence down to our very souls. Come to us this day and send your Holy Spirit. Move in our hearts, help us to hear the challenge of the gospel. Because we know that you love us and that you want us to find life. Bless the speaking, the hearing, and the living of your holy word. Amen. So Brett Blair tells a story about a church meeting and there's a wealthy member of the church. He rose to tell the rest of those present about his Christian faith. I'm a multi-billionaire, he said, and I attribute my wealth to the blessings of God in my life. And then he went on to recall a turning point in his relationship with the Lord. As a young man, he had earned his first commission, $100 back then. And to celebrate the deed, he cast a check and he got a single $100 bill. That night, he went to church. He heard a missionary relate about his work to feed and clothe those who were in desperate need. And before the offering plate was passed, the preacher told everyone there that everything that was collected that night would be given to this missionary to help fund his work on behalf of the church. Well, the wealthy man, he started thinking back at that time, had $100, and he just made that. That was a lot back then. And he wanted to support the mission work, but, I mean, what was he going to do? Make a change in the offering plate? He really couldn't do that. He knew he had either had to, to give it all or nothing at all. And at that moment, God moved in his heart, and he gave all that he had to God. He knew that God had blessed that decision and had made him successful. When he finished, there was silence in the room. He goes back to the seat. And there was this elderly lady behind him kind of leaned forward and said, I dare you to do it again. <laughs> I don't know if he did. My thoughts is he probably didn't. But, you know, what is it we taste after life? I mean, what is it we think that's going to satisfy us or give us meaning? If we peeked into our soul, what would we say is, purpose of life? Is it the rat race somebody seems so bent on running? Or does Jesus give us some insight today, even though we probably don't want to hear it? I think everyone wants success, however you define it, but what does that look for you, look like for you? Is it a sense of accomplishment, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of reward and approval? Maybe purpose. And whether it's love or acceptance or money or some cause, we bank our lives on following the path towards our version of success. Find a purpose of life. Jesus hits us with some pretty hard words today. Things that probably go against the way you're wired. About giving all of your wealth to the poor. Not some, not even 10%, but all of it. To give all your possessions away and follow Jesus. But these are the words that lead to eternal life. And how can we ever hope to follow them? One of my favorite authors is Richard Moore, who I got into in the last five years. He has great insight into the spiritual and, and finding our true lives in Christ. In his book, Everything Belongs, the Gift of contemplative prayer, he begins with a short little confession entitled Inherent Unmarketability, which in itself declares how difficult it is to embark upon a journey of spiritual growth. And he writes, how do you make attractive that which is not? How do you sell emptiness, vulnerability, and non-success? How do you talk about Descent. When everything's about ascent, how can you 
could possibly market letting go in a capitalist culture? How do you present Jesus to a Promethean mind? How do you talk about dying to a church trying to appear perfect? This is not going to work. Admitting this might be my first step. So often it seems like the church, people of Christ, a lot of times, to me it seems like they go out of their way to pollute the word of God. They lift out certain passages, but then they forget about the meaning of the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ. So many Christians have turned our faith into a, some kind of a transaction just about admitting sin, receiving forgiveness, and then you've got your golden ticket to heaven, and that's all you need. And that's all there is to living the gospel. And with this enormous emphasis on the cross and Jesus' death, sometimes we miss the whole of Jesus' life and ministry and what he was about and what he was really about sent to do. Now, this might shock you, but despite what so many believe, I'm going to tell you that Jesus didn't come to this earth just to bring you to heaven after you die. Now, I want to say that again. Jesus didn't just come to this earth to bring you to heaven after you die. Jesus came to bring heaven to you. Jesus came to bring heaven And you don't have to take my word for it. Because it's right here in the Word of God, in the story we have today, in the conversations Jesus has with his disciples. And the story today of this daring rich man, rich man who was so embedded in the wealth of, in the world of wealth and possessions, and his reaction. So let's take a closer look at the passage. It begins with this man running up and kneeling reverently before Jesus, asking him what he must do to inherit eternal life. And though we might picture an arrogant man, really the way Mark tells the story, this guy seems humble and forthright. This is a guy who honestly wants to do the right thing. He is just like us. He's just like us. I mean, who here doesn't want to do the right thing by God? Who here doesn't want to experience the kingdom and have eternal life? We are just like him. And when the guy asks, after a little rebuttal about only God being good, Jesus simply tells him to obey the commandments. But the guy responds, he's kept these all his life since his youth. And that's when Jesus really lets him have it. Now, I like how the message puts it. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. And loved him. He said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth then will be heavenly wealth. And come, follow me. Those are pretty tough words, right? Are to hear hard even more to put in practice. But it revolves around what our purpose of life is. And you have to realize it was out of Jesus' great love for this person that he told him this thing. Jesus honestly, sincerely wants this man, wants all of us. To know what life is really about. To discover what is possible with God. And this incredible, wondrous, abiding relationship that our Lord is offering to all of us. And though we may chase all these other things, here God is pursuing us with the gift of heaven on earth. Now scripture tells us that the man went away shocked and grieving. We don't know if he did what Christ commanded or not, but at this point, Jesus resumes his attack on the, against the wealth. And this time, he turns to his disciples, who hear his reign. He tells them how hard it is for a person of wealth to enter the kingdom of God. 
and we get that legendary line how it's harder for a camel to get to the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Wealth can be an enormous stumbling block in the Christian faith. It's not that money is evil. It's the love of money that ends our lives. It's that embrace that is so alluring. Here we are in the United States, arguably the richest nation in the world, where we live with so many comforts and conveniences, for even those at the middle class level, we have so much compared to others, especially when we look around the world. And everything in the world in our lives, it revolves around money, about material things in this world. From the cars we drive, the houses we own, the phones in our pockets, how much taxes we have to pay, to what we bring home in our paychecks. And really, the point of the story is not to bring us disillusionment or shock, grief. Jesus is being realistic about how tempting wealth can be and what a roadblock it is to the Christian faith. Money is a thing we can't get away from. I mean, it's in the world. And although some have tried to live in truly communal societies where all is shared and held in common, we all know that that is next to impossible. Because we are sinful human beings. None of us are good. That's part of what Jesus said at the beginning. And like it or not, we feel that we need certain things in our life. But my point of the story, my friends, is that it's all about where your priorities are. And that Jesus is asking us to take a hard look at our lives and to decide what we are really chasing. And the things we're chasing, wealth might be for some, for others it might be something else. But ask us, are we truly being faithful to God and Jesus Christ? Are we just serving ourselves, worshiping maybe the God of material wealth? And the reason Jesus says that it's harder for a camel to get to the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God is because the more wealth a person has, the harder it is to set your mind to God and to let God be first in our lives. Because God is a jealous God, a God who demands all of our lives. And we can't have divided loyalties, that our whole lives must be dedicated to Christ, not just part of it, not just a tenth of our income, not just a part that goes to church on Sunday mornings, but all of our lives. God wants it all. The purpose of life. What are you chasing? What holds the greatest meaning for you, the greatest purpose, the greatest endearment? And then what is Jesus saying to you today about the things that you think are so important? Are you ready to give it all up and surrender and then follow Jesus in the way? What Jesus offers, my friends, it's not a one shop stop to instant gratification. Rather, Jesus offers us a path of discipleship, a walk of faith, and a cross. Not just one moment in time, 2,000 years ago, but a cross that is real and just as costly today. After Jesus laid all this out, Peter, often our spokesperson, expresses his frustration. Look, we have left everything and followed you. I think Peter at that moment is questioning in his life what life is all about, if it's really been worth it. But with the patience of a saint and a love that knows no limits, Jesus tells them that this way of life of following Jesus is everything. All that sacrifice, giving up so much, following this Messiah of God knows where, all with nothing but the clothes on your back and a faith born of God, None of it will be in vain, Peter. And that the truth, my friend, 
is that such a journey is greater than you could possibly imagine. And you will receive a hundredfold that which you give. Because instead of chasing all the time in your life, instead of running and searching and scrambling to get ahead, like we're in some kind of rut race trying to find the magic cheese, somehow we will realize that God has been there all along, loving us. What we really need to do is to stop chasing, to wake up, to see the flowers all around us, and to breathe in the presence of God and the grace is free. Wake up, my friends. Look around yourself. Breathe in the presence of God. I think of this always in terms of this uh, fresh bread baking. You know, it's fun. Now I'm going to get you all hungry. Because when I was a kid, when we would go to Grandma's house and we would go through the Walt Illinois, we went right by a Wonder Bakery. And it smelled good. Oh my gosh, it smelled good. And we've always got so hungry going through. I'm getting hungry myself. Faith, my friends, it's less of a chase. And it's more of an awareness that God gives you everything that you can ever hunger for and ever need. And it's just that good. Jesus is the one that has the words to eternal life. Stop chasing what the world says is important. And embrace the God who loves you, loves you where you are at right now, loves you enough to invite you to walk in Jesus' footsteps, to surrender this love, and thus find it, to find purpose, to find what life in the kingdom is all about. Thanks be to God. Amen.